Now again today, Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. We're going to look, to look today in Luke for a second. We're going to look about in Luke 15. Well, first verse, uh, Luke 4 and 14, it said, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee, and then went out of fame of him through all the region round about. Now what this was is this was concerning all of the miracles that he had done and all the things he had performed. And because he had done that, it actually began uh, with the changing of the water into wine in Canaan. Remember, his mother said to them, whatever he said to you, do it. And he did. He told them to fill those uh, firkins, those jugs full of the water, and Jesus turned them into wine. And they served that. Verse 15 said, And he taught in a synagogue, being glorified of all. Now this is talking about the beginning. This was the beginning of the world soon to change. You know, Jesus was the world changer. He wasn't just the place changer for right there. He changed the whole world. When he came, and he came to change, he changed the whole world right then. That was the beginning of the world changed by one man, Jesus Christ. God in the flesh came to dwell among men and to uh, prophesy the truth. This, this prophecy was not a fantasy. This was a prophecy of the truth. He was telling the truth. And as, as he uh, taught in the synagogue, there was delivered unto him the book. And in that day, the book was a scroll. It was rolled up. And he began to preach out of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, Isaiah 61, 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now this was written some thousand years before, and here he is now telling that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Uh, we learn here of the absolute, the necessity of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit within our lives. We must have the Holy Spirit in our lives if we're going to live a Christian life. What is your desire in life? Is your desire in life to please the Holy Spirit? Is your desire in life to please God? Or is your desire in life just to please yourself? To gather up things, to gather up uh, memories, to gather up places, to gather up ideas. But this is all things we all have in us and we all want to do. And we all want to be careful, though, that we don't do that more for us than we do for God. It's important that we do things for God and in God and through God. Uh, we learn here about the absolute necessity of the personal work of the Holy Spirit. It was absolutely necessary for Jesus to come. If he hadn't, you and I would not have redemption today. The cross was prophesied all the way through the Old Testament. To preach the gospel to the poor, this is what he says. To preach the gospel to the poor. Do you know, he's not just talking about the poor people. He's talking about those poor in spirit. Because the spirit of the Antichrist, the devil, is a poor spirit, a bad spirit, the wrong spirit, the spirit that takes you opposite from heaven, takes you to hell. So, he's preaching deliverance to the captive now. The, the, I was captive one time, and you've been captive at one time. If you're watching PhD, it's probably because you have um, had an experience with Jesus Christ, and you're looking for a teaching or a knowledge that you can grow thereby. I can tell you where it is. It's in this book. It's not in Brother Peter. It's in this book. You open this book up and you get in it and you get the knowledge that you need to have to be able to and the deliverance. Uh, if we'll notice, he didn't say to deliver the captives but rather to preach deliverance. Now he himself was not the came to he could not deliver himself the whole world at that time, but through the Spirit, he could deliver the whole world for all time by his word. This is his word. 
that is left here. This is the Spirit of God in our hands. He has left for us. Wow. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down. Uh, this portrays the custom of the time. He got up, read the scriptures, and then he portrayed the custom of the times. He went and he sat down. And the eyes of all of them were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now, that's the same exact thing you and I are to do today. We are to fasten our eyes on Jesus Christ. If we don't fasten our eyes on him, you fasten your eyes on me, you've got nothing. But you fasten your eyes on the word that God would have me say, his word, the same word he preached, the same words he said, the same words, the same thing he did. You fasten your eyes on that, you fasten your life on that, and you'll have something to fasten to. Even though uh, most of them would have failed to see it, this represented the moment for exceeding anything these people had ever known. <laughs> they had, nobody had ever uh, seen a man with this kind of power. The Holy Spirit's power had been revealed until Jesus came like it was revealed then. And then he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. He didn't say it was fulfilled in your eyes, even though the scripture was fulfilled in their eyes, that Jesus had come and he was there in their eyes. But he's saying, I'm fulfilling the scripture in your ears that Isaiah spoke about back over there in 61. In effect, he says, I am the Messiah. This is what he's telling them. I am the Messiah. The fulfillment of these scriptures. And all bear him witness. That means they all understood exactly what he said. But all did not believe him. And <laughs> neither will all of you believe him either. You may hear me speak. You may hear other preachers speak. You may see the word of God proclaimed everywhere. But that doesn't mean that you're going to believe it. You're going to say, well, that, that book's a bunch of foolishness. That, that's just a bunch of myth. That's a bunch of everything. I got news for you. I can prove this is a living book. This is a living book. This book is alive. You can read it today and have the same feeling, the same Jesus, the same prophecies in you. And, and come to you. All bear him witness. All understood exactly what he said, but all did not believe. Let's look at this. The one they and they wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. This you know what this means? This means they were not only given a small portion of the things that were actually said, but they were uh, and then and then they said, "Is this not Joseph's son?" <laughs> they began to question in themselves about the human father of Jesus. See, they did not know about his uh, immaculate conception that he had. That Joseph was not really the father; he was the stepfather of of him. And this refers to the fact that they could not equate. They couldn't equate the gracious words that this carpenter they had known for about 30 years was saying. Evidently, Jesus hadn't said too much. He was there doing his carpenter work. He was doing what an average man should do, and that's uh, keeping his own mind, his own business, keeping his work up, doing what he should do, and uh, not said too much. I kind of, I've got an uncle. Uh, he was in heaven now. His name was Russell Turner. And he was in Maine. By the way, I'm in Maine today. We're on vacation. I'm here in Maine today. And uh, one of our relatives and friends and brother in the Lord, sister in the Lord, in their uh, little place where they have singings every night. They're having a singing here tonight. We went to one last night. We've been here five nights. I guess we've been to five different singings. And we've uh, really enjoyed the fellowship that is in the Christian community, whether we're in the state of Georgia or whether we're in the state of Maine, the Christian community has a fellowship that you can come and join with. 
Now it doesn't matter. We've had uh, here in the last few nights, we've had every denomination represented and all of the denominations. Jesus said, don't let there be, and Paul said, don't let there be any schisms or isms in the church. Take your schisms and your isms out of the church. Say, well, I'm of, I'm of Apollos and, and I'm of John and I'm of Jesus and I'm of Philip. No, that's not the way it works. No matter who you are affiliated with, it all should boil down to Jesus Christ and that's what counts. It doesn't matter how you sing your songs, <laughs> what mannerisms you use. What matters is are you worshiping Christ in your life? Let's look at verse 23. He said unto them, You will surely say unto me, This proverb, this physician, uh, heal yourself. How could this carpenter be the Messiah? Whatsoever. We have heard in Capernaum, do also hear you here in the country. This means it was being performed not right there in Capernaum, but it was being performed throughout the whole country. Now, we live in, I happen to live in the United States of America. And here I am all the way uh, from uh, middle America in Georgia. Uh, all the way down to the coast of Maine, the last very state in the United States of America as you come up to uh, the place where you be in Canada. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And this is the truth. A lot of people that knew me before I was saved, before I came a person who read, studied the Bible, and prophesied the Bible. Before that happened, there was a lot of people that knew me as a drunk. And they knew me as a sot, and a thief, and a liar, and a cheat. And they knew me for all of those things. And because they did, they, they won't accept me as a, a prophesier of the Word, or as a person, a preacher of the Word. So he predicted their unbelief. He knew they would have unbelief. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do many works in that part of the country because it takes belief and reception. People have to receive what God is giving them. If they don't receive it, then, then, then it's not effective for them. So that's it. So, but we are to proclaim no matter where we are, we are to proclaim the righteousness of Jesus Christ in no uncertain terms. And that's what we're supposed to do. It said there were many widows in Israel in those days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months when a great famine was throughout all the land. And now Jesus is telling them this story. And this was a story that was in the Old Testament. They could have read it for themselves and the priest more than likely did. Whether they told the people about it though is another whole matter. So they proclaim at the time of uh, Ahab and the great uh, wickedness concerning the northern kingdom of Israel. God had to shut down the system. He made a system that worked. They could grow food, they could have food to eat, they could raise animals, they could have meat, they could do, uh, they had a place they could worship, they could do all of that stuff. But they turned it all to reprobate. They turned it all over and started worshiping gods. They whittled with their hands. They started worshiping the, the uh, animals and the plants and the things rather than God. The men started worshiping the women and, and vice versa. And it became a, a heathen land. And God said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just shut the heavens up for about three and a half years. And we'll see at the end of that period of time just exactly how you are, what you feel, how you feel. <laughs> I got news for you. There's coming a day, and I said last night to my friend here in Maine, there's coming a day when this computer deal is going to be shut down. Poof! Just like that. And everybody's going to be left in their own little corner by their own little self with nothing but their own little mind. If they haven't got God in their heart, do you know that that leads to destruction? People without God in their heart 
end up wanting to self-destruct. They say the only way I know to get out of this misery is to just end my life. And that, be, but that's not it. I'm, let me tell you, folks. Any one of you listening to this, you come to that place in life. It's not self-destruction in that sense. It's destruct your uh, wicked self by saying, "God, I am a sinner." Forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul. You'll have a complete change of life right then. Find your Bible. I guarantee you, I have left enough Bibles around the United States around so that anybody that follows behind me can find the Word of God, can find a way and tracks that I carry. These little things right here that tell you the plan of salvation. You can pick these up all over the world. Just about any way you go, you can find the plan of salvation. You find that, you do what it says. You just ask God to save and He will. Remember now that uh, many of these things were done on the Sabbath day. Verse 31 said, He came down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee. They were astonished at His doctrine, for His word was with power. Man. Your word, if you've got God in your heart, you've got power. And that power is not of yourself. It is the power of God come on you. We went to a singing last night, and I really prayed. I really prayed. Those people came a long ways. But not did they just come a long ways. Their father was laying in state. He had passed away the day before. And they came off, their mother, that's the, the, the wife of the husband laying in state, and the children, the two daughters and the son, and their daddy's laying in state. And they came off and sang. And they came off and worshipped God. They came off and filled their life with what God would have them filled their life. And I really prayed for that man, and the Holy Spirit came and gave him great freedom to sing, great freedom to do what he did last night. And and where you say, where are you, Peter? We're, we're up in this little old state of Maine, in a little old corner of the world, in the backwoods, and it's the same kind of setting, and a, a, a fact of the matter, it's kind of like the setting when Jesus was where he was. And he just walked off into the wilderness, and he got on, a, on a, underneath a juniper tree somewhere, uh, and he started speaking, and he started preaching. And people started gathering. They, they began to come from, from afar and from near and from here and from there. And when he, he backed out on the Sea of Gennesaret and he out on the ship, and, and he, he put his hands up like this, and everybody just hushed, and they listened. And his voice came in off the water. And that's how they, they preached. The water was their sound system. And they, he preached off the water, and they all heard with their ears, and God opened their hearts, and they received. It's like when Peter preached, and 5,000 were saved, and then 4,000 were saved. Hey, when God comes on the scene, people get saved. When God comes on the scene. Last night, there was one person in that uh, singing meeting that needed to be saved. There may have been more, but there was one who accepted. There was one who shot his hand up all the way up high. I'm asking Jesus, forgive me of my sin, come in my heart and save my soul. It was worth the trip for these folks to come. Leave that daddy laying there in state that that one person got saved. That one person will not have to spend eternity in hell, hellfire squirming and dying in, in that place. So he was in the synagogue, was a man which had a spirit of unclean devils. That was demons. He was full of demons and cried out with a loud voice. This means that it wasn't necessarily the man crying out. It was the demons out of the man crying out, and the demons knew Jesus. And they saying, let us alone. <laughs> but when they knew Jesus was in the present, they knew they was in trouble. They were fixing to get put out. They were in trouble, and they knew it. So this refers to the fact that Jesus alone is the one that has the power to do that, and and so he and uh, so he comes up and he says this: What have we to do with thee, you, thou Jesus of Nazareth? 
You see, the devil knows Jesus. The demons know Jesus. They know where he is, when he is, and they know they've got to flee in front of him. They cannot fight him. So this portrays the total, the, the total uh, separation of the spirit world and, and, and the light world, the world of, of the world of God. And the spirit world, the world of the devil, has got to flee. It said, Ah, are you come to destroy us? This is what they're asking Jesus. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Can you imagine standing in a group of people and here's a man standing there and he's not really saying anything but these spirits are talking out of him probably in some uh, real deep voice or whatever and they're saying, uh, we know you, we know what you're fixing to do and Jesus rebuked him and the evil spirit in the man saying, hold your peace, shut up and come out of him. A command that had to be obeyed. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, that threw him down on the ground, he came out of him and heard him not. He didn't hurt him anymore, and he wasn't there anymore in him. Uh, the command of the Lord will cast the evil spirit out of you and me. When I first came to him, 3 o'clock in the morning, November 5th, 1972, and he touched me and said, your number's up. I said, God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. Do you know that I never took another drink from that day to this? Not one, never desired to? You know I've never swore a cuss word from that day to this? What happened? Jesus took and drove the evil demons out of me. Drove those spirits out of me. And he'll drive them out of you if you'll accept him. So Jesus rebuked him. And, and when the devil had thrown him down. Let's go to verse 36. And this is, we are in Luke chapter 4. And they were all amazed and spoke among themselves saying, What a word is this? The, uh, uh, the presence that which they had never before seen or felt. They had a presence among them that they had never ever experienced before. And the power. For which authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits? And they came out. They recognized that he was the author of that power. That's what they recognized. And people will recognize that you have a different spirit in you when you ask Jesus to come into your heart and save your soul. They will recognize that you are different. And the fame of him went out in every place in the country round about. And don't you know it went further than that? I can tell you how far it went. We've got it in our hand. Some 3,000 years later, we have that same word in our hand. That same word is still going out. Still going out by the same Jesus who hung on the cross, raised again on the third day, went to be with the Father. It's still there. We still have it. It's not going anywhere. It's here. Left for you and I in this book. And this is, we have it right here. He's, he is the word. He was the Word. Jesus said in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And that was Jesus Christ. He was made flesh and dwelt among us. And His Word is the Word that you and I have to have for the day. Alright. He rose out of the synagogue and entered into Simon's house. Uh, this was his headquarters during the three and a half years of his public ministry. During those three and a half years, he, he kept himself in Simon's house, Simon Peter's house. And he did that for a reason. Simon Peter had given himself to God, had given his house to God. You remember when Jesus first came into the country, where did he go? He went to uh, Peter's mother-in-law's 
uh, where his mother-in-law lived. I'm sure that was Simon Peter's house. Uh, and it was his headquarters. And Simon Peter's wife's mother was there. And Jesus picked this place out to spend some time. And he gave them great favor, and he gave Peter great favor. You know, Peter was a, a cusser. Peter was a, a follower of the, the devil. And, uh, and Jesus saved that man's soul and put him on the right path. Uh, his mother-in-law had a wife had a threatening a life-threatening uh, sickness and uh, when he, he came there and he stood over her and rebuked the fever and it left her and immediately she rose up and ministered unto them this was something that uh, women actually did in that day they ministered unto those that were in the house they they cooked the meals, they helped, they got the things ready, they kept the house nice, and they did everything they had to do. And that, that was a, a thing that they did. And so, uh, this speaks of an uh, instant recovery. Do you not know that when <laughs> somebody laying at death's point and Jesus heals them, it does more for them, it does more for those around them than you can imagine. Could you imagine? Even though this was Peter's mother-in-law, whatever had happened to his wife is never said. She perhaps had died with the same illness. And she perhaps had died a day before. Who knows? Nobody knows. But we do know that his mother-in-law was still there. And we do know that Peter, Peter's job in life now and in that day he had to take care of his mother-in-law it doesn't say there there is a father-in-law it doesn't say there's anybody else there but there is a mother-in-law and it's Peter's job to take care of her and we'll have to take care of her throughout so for three and a half years Jesus had a central place where he could come don't you know the house was open to him don't you know he could walk in and out the door of that house without knocking that they say don't come up here and knock on this door this is now your house too wow wouldn't that be something and that's what we're supposed to be have something i have jesus in my house he doesn't have to knock to come in he's already in me and he's already there he can come and go but see, if he doesn't ever go he stays in my house and i do know i do believe that there are people who have asked Jesus into their heart, but they entertain such things in their house that Jesus can't be seen there, can't be known there. I hear the preachers say a lot of times, say, have you got something in your house that if you knew Jesus was going to walk into your house today, you would either have to hide it or go burn it or get rid of it? Well, if you do, he knows it already. And if he's in you, he knows it's there. And if your eyes cross over the path of something that shouldn't cross over, and it's in your house, you need to take and get rid of it. I had this, I used to sell junk. And I had this, I had this beautiful uh, uh, marble, uh, it wasn't marble, it was uh, uh, made with uh, like elephant tusk, Buddha. And it was probably worth a thousands of dollars for its uh, antique aspect. It had come from somewhere, somebody had brought it from another country. But God began to trouble me with that thing. He said, it's another God. You have a false God sitting in your house. <laughs> I took that thing out and I said, well, money or not, I'm not going to sell it so somebody else can worship it. And I took the back of the axe and I, I I tried busting that thing. I couldn't bust it up. I buried it in the ground. I dug a hole and buried that thing so nobody would ever get a hold of it again or whatever. No matter how much it was worth, it wasn't worth enough for me, money-wise or any other way, to deny my God for that one. So I got rid of that thing. And that's what we need to do. We need to get those gods out of our life. We need to take whatever it takes to bust them out, to get them out of our life. 
Well, I see our time has about come and gone here. And uh, this was a little 30 minute thing. It said, and when they had done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes. Now, Jesus had told them in the next, in chapter 5, that he had come, Jesus had come up to the boat. And well, quickly, let me read this. And it came to pass that as the people passed upon, pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw uh, two ships standing in the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. They had already jumped in the water. They had got close enough so they could jump in the water and they probably was a little about waist deep and they're shaking their nets up and down. They're washing their nets in the water and they're pulling them up and they're finding out if there's any holes in them or anything and they patch and mend them right there and then they roll their nets up and put them back on the boat. And he entered one of the ships which Simon Peters and uh, prayed him that he would uh, thrust out a little from the land and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And this was his uh, entrance to teaching the people out of the ship on the water. What people? They had gathered amidst the people. Wherever Jesus was, people gathered. And that's the same way today. Here we are in this little building and people gather here and they gather here to worship. They gather here. Somebody's going to sing about Jesus and they're going to sing about God and they're going to sing the songs of and the praises of the saints in this little building down here in the backwoods in the country the cottage in the woods and they're gonna they're gonna come and worship God and people come and you know I was over in a tent the other night and people singing and people stop by the way and, and come in they say hey there's a singing or there's a preaching or there's something and people who are in tune with the same Jesus and the same God you're in tune with will stop and want a fellowship and sometimes God will stop a person and they'll come in and God says to that person, hey, you go on in there and see what's going on. So out of curiosity, they come in and see what's going on and the Lord gets a hold of them and they ask Jesus to save them. <laughs> and that's the way it works. Uh, so he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep. Let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, and nevertheless, whoo! <laughs> if Jesus tells you to do something, nevertheless, you do it. You do it. If Jesus said do it, you do it. And he said, nevertheless, I will let down the nets. Here's a, here's a seasoned fisherman. And he's, he's just a little ways from the shore. And he said, hey, Jesus, you know there's no fish in here. We've been out in the deep. We've been dragging in the deep all night. But nevertheless, he threw them down. And when they had thus done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes in their nets and that, that broke, uh, uh, broke, had broken unto their partners, which were in the other ship. They beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship. Uh, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled the ships, both ships. Listen to that. They filled the ships so that they began to sink. <laughs> and when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. <laughs> You're going to say two things when you meet Jesus. One or two things. They're either going to say, come in and save me and get in me and be with me. Or you're going to say, I don't want nothing to do with you. Depart from me. Peter couldn't understand that. He said, depart from me. But he said it for this reason. Fell down on Jesus' knees. For he was astonished. And all who were with him at the draught of fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the son of Zebedee were the partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth you shall catch men. This is our commission, my friends. Your commission and my commission is to catch fish for Jesus. Catch 
people for Jesus. Make disciples and make apostles of God. And when they had brought their ships to the land, they forsook all and followed him. Wow. This means they gave their ships away. They forsook everything they had. They walked off and they followed Jesus. For the next three years, they followed Jesus. They became disciples of the word. They never went hungry. They never, they never had to go in a big sense of the word, destitute, even though they would have, and there perhaps was a time when you, you had to skip a meal, but they also had to skip a meal when they were fishing on the boat, too. And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy came. This is where he healed the leper. Our time has come and gone. We'll uh, see you uh, next time. It's Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. And bye-bye.